Constantine, it is such a pleasure to have you on Block by Block. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. Excited to be here. So you founded Block Damon more than five years ago, and since then you have it grown into one of the leading infrastructure companies in the industry. I'm so fascinated to learn more about how you ended up on this path. But first, mm -hmm. uh, for folks that might not be familiar, can you just share a little bit about yourself? Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm, uh, you know, I'm from Germany. I was born in Frankfurt. I'm going to not give you the whole Vitae, but uh, uh, that's uh, if you hear an accent, that's why. Um, I uh, started in network communication working at telcos. And so I, my first job after an analyst program in, in New York out of school uh, was um, uh, working for Deutsche Telekom doing mobile network strategy and commercial models. And so I've done that early in like, you know, 1999, 2000, uh, when mobile phones were, uh, you know, kind of a new thing, really. Um, and so always fascinated with new uh, data um, transfer models, new monetization models around data packages and all that type of stuff. Um, I worked with a really interesting guy back then, um, a guy called Nika Sharoa, who's now CEO of Palo Alto Networks. He was chief business officer at Google for a while. And, uh, and, and so kind of really interesting time, lots of smart people in that air arena trying to figure out how that works. And uh, I um, then worked for Nokia uh, in software strategy um, and then became an entrepreneur, I want to say 14, 15 years ago, uh, really at a point where I felt stuck in my career because I always got frustrated with uh, my ideas not being not getting realized, you know. So in large companies, obviously things function a little differently, and I was always somebody who wanted to, um, you know, kind of solve complex problems holistically. And so I was not a great employee because rather than someone telling me to do something, I was a little more like, well, you know, how what should, shouldn't we do this completely different? And uh, and it just sort of got me into a point of such frustration that I figured I just need to own what I do. And, uh, you know, met a guy, actually Chris Blackwell, who was the founder of, um, uh, of Island Records and uh, um, who's, you know, an older gentleman at that point, but uh, owned a lot of music related um, properties. And so we've uh, set out to build uh, a transcoding engine for music files mm -hmm. where you upload a file once and it spits out formats that can go. It all like starts in music, like it goes back to music. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, that was like kind of, you know, I always actually, you know, another example, and I, I'll say it here, um, when we talk about the state of crypto, I always reference Pirate Bay and Spotify, mm -hmm. um, because I feel like music really was the first digital asset of note. And, uh, you know, I always say we're at this shift from Pirate Bay to Spotify is, is currently where the industry is at, but I'm going to come back to that. But anyway, so, you know, I did that and, and uh, that was the first time CEO gig. Um, in a startup and, and, you know, I, I, you know, the thing was good, but I, I wasn't overly successful, mostly because I really struggled with understanding capitalization strategy and, 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 you know, sort of kind of the pretty typical errors. So then, um, you know, helped uh, build another startup, um, company that was sold, um, and people made a little bit of money. And then I worked on another startup, um, with, uh, another group of folks and then people made a little more money. Conceptually, they were always the same. It was always, uh, then it was photography, then it was video. Uh, oh, so always distributing data. Uh, my tagline throughout all these companies was always upload once market everywhere, very B2B, a SaaS focus, so pretty traditional, um, and uh, sold the last company in 2017. Now, um, my love for crypto started probably in 2013 or something when good friends of mine, you know, put me on Bitcoin, uh, made me buy a Bitcoin, uh, not not a lot. And so this is not as exciting as it sounds. <laughs> but, um, it got me uh, thinking about crypto. And I, since 2015, have been sort of active in the space, even though I had other roles and things. I've been uh, working with people. Um, I was an advisor to a few CEOs on how to scale companies in the first wave of VC funding mm -hmm. companies. I uh, worked with a friend of mine, Micah who started a company called Gem that we actually subsequently last year acquired. And so that was all sort of in 2015 and, and, and helped work with some of the early uh, folks in the space to launch some foundations around tokens in 2016, 2017. And so at that point, I knew I really wanted to be in crypto full time. And when I had the bandwidth 
to start a business, um, I went about it fairly, you know, kind of analytically, which was mm -hmm. looking at um, what is a good access point into crypto that I think has legs to stand on over time. Yeah, I mean, I think that's uh, the journey that you just highlighted is so interesting. First of all, if I just can take you back to a second for Deutsche Telekom, I spent a lot of time with Deutsche Telekom and a bunch of telcos when I was at Mozilla, really mm -hmm. trying to, at the time we were building um, at Mozilla, we were building uh, an, an HTML5 based uh, web phone. And so we were trying to get them to really think about, and they and many of them, including Deutsche Telekom, signed on to do it. But it was really hard because of the notion of the the innovation pipeline there takes a long time. So I think the frustration point with that is like consistent with how you got to the, your endpoint journey, which is really kind of doing it yourself. Totally. Yeah. No. And 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 that's been interesting too because once I I became responsible, I started to be successful. And so that was interesting for me. And, and um, it took me a long time to mature enough to know that, you know, I can't follow a normal career path. Like I, I always was like, oh, you got to get go to business school and then you do this. And then two years you do this and this. And it just didn't work for me um, because I, I, I need to be passionate about what I do and I need to be a little bit ride or die with it. You know, like there's a certain shape uh, of psychology that I need to work with. And and uh, and that's definitely, I think, that has matured a lot. The other thing I think is that I'm, you know, a little older, I guess, and I've lost my ego on the way uh, to mm -hmm. some extent. So I've, I've run enough companies and worked hard enough <clears throat> to be very happy if there's somebody smarter to help me with something. Um, I don't need to be uh, the person in the room that, solves every problem or is recognized as such, you know, like I can um, very happily, um, uh, you know, fall victim to the success of an entity, for example. And that's also really important. Well, I think that there's two things there. First, when I think about my uh, kids, I have, um, I, I mentioned before we, we started recording, we have four boys that are in college. Well, one just graduated. So we have uh, three others that are still in college and they're constantly trying to figure out like, what's the journey for their career? And my thing is always like, there is no like journey. Like you kind of have to, no cut journey. You have to figure it out for yourselves. I was the same. Like I did a, you know, I was a trial lawyer and then ended up in doing many, many different things after that. And so it's really all about like, you have to follow your passion and frankly, what you're good at. And so it's just an interesting thing to think about when you have kids. And I know you do like how, how to really get them to be thinking about themselves and not like what the, what the world tells them that they should be doing. Correct. And I feel like I've done that mistake excessively. I read every book. I, I was a golden child in like coming from like business school and early jobs and stuff. Like I always was super ambitious, uh, but I never, you know, it's the difference between, you know, getting what you need and what you want. You know, I got what I wanted, but I had to learn the hard way. It wasn't what I needed. And so, yeah. um, but, you know, I'm very happy obviously with where I'm yeah. at now. So I can't really complain too much. I mean, it sounds like the, I mean, we have a similar in terms of like our experience with the web one and web two days and um, then really leveraging that into like what happens for web three and that maturity that web three, uh, I think has gotten more of over the last year, but kind of really needs to be able to get to sort of the next level. So do you see inspirations or insights that you've brought from those early days of tech that you really see could or need to be really applied in web three today? Yeah, I mean, I think I see uh, so many similarities. Obviously, it's the same problem was always how do you get larger incumbents involved in something that's new that breaks processes, as well as revenue lines, which are deeply ingrained in, in, in businesses. And so if you want to change how p companies spend their money, or make revenue over time, it's normal that the companies who've done that, uh, you know, only reluctantly will do so. And uh, with as little risk as possible. And so convincing companies that that's a good idea over time is something I think um, I've learned uh, doing back then. Uh, I also think that the rigor of, uh, I think, back then, specifically professionalism and trying to really bring um, an appreciation of, of why these companies are so complex and patience uh, to them. You know, it's easy to kind of go in there and be like, oh, you guys are just sleeping dinosaurs. Ha ha. Um, you're going to get eaten up. You know, like that's not going to get you anywhere. And so for us, um, very early on we really wanted to be a thought partner and we really didn't want to 
um, be arrogant in that way, you know, like I think to really understand it's actually very hard to build a company as big as, I don't know, Bank of New York or JP Morgan or uh, Goldman Sachs, like, um, and, uh, you know, they do certain things really, really well. And, 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 you know, you need to understand a little bit um, about that, you know, and so I think you need to meet them uh, where they are. And, uh, and it's important to um, also look a little bit like someone they can dog on to. And, and that had a lot to do with structural components, for example, of our business, which I think made us successful over time because not a lot of crypto companies have done that, which is, mm -hmm. you know, we have a normal board. Um, I, uh, you know, we're a normal C Corp. Um, we have audited financials. We're audited also on technology and security. Um, there's uh, oversight, you know, all these sort of type of things that maybe initially people don't necessarily associate with crypto, but they also should because crypto obviously is all about trust. And if you, as a company, if you want to build trustless systems, you need to be trusted. And so, isn't that the uh, irony of it though? So many people think that right. the trustless means that it can truly be trustless, but you can never get rid of that trust factor in business. You just can't. That's right. And I think that people forget that. Totally. And, 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 and that's exa exactly right. And so, and then how do you build trust? You know, trust is built over time. Um, you have to be consistent. It's things that are a little boring um, sometimes when it comes to, uh, you know, kind of novel technologies. But if you want to really change the world, you need to change, you know, you need to be able to work with existing systems to then get real scale. And so I think the the choice we've made, uh, like, like and, and you know, I'm really actually a very deep crypto believer, and mm -hmm. I believe and love crypto because I do think nation states have some explaining to do, and um, I do think monetary policy uh, of individual nation states doesn't aid the uh, you know humanity as a whole, and and you know, like there's a lot of things around how we distribute value and middleman and all that type of stuff that I think um, uh, crypto is a potential answer for. Um, and I, I do think that there's a part of it like that needs to be completely out outside that system, but there also needs the part of it that ch changes and works with the existing system. Um, and so um, I believe that um, the biggest on ramps to crypto over time are going to be companies like JP Morgan, you know, yeah. and so like just sort of not working with them and say, hey, your billion customers aren't of interest to us um, is foolish and and elitist also, frankly, because the uh, normal person, you know, is not somebody who currently can really engage in crypto easily. And that's just the truth. And that was goes back to this. We're still in the pirate bay day of, uh, of digital money. You know, um, you still have to kind of, you know, you're still in, in a complex world. Um, we're still very far away from an experience like a music and Spotify, where it's like, oh, this is really easy. I can get every music I want. And um, and so forth. And so I think we're, we're, we've made a lot of progress, but there's still a long way to go. Um, but I do, I am excited because I do think there was a systemic change in crypto, um, sort of to the end of last year, early this year, um, that is important for us, which is really bringing things on chain, uh, um, chains being developed that allow for really smart application of smart contracts. You know, some of the stellar projects fall among that. Um, and so I think um, the next step is getting things on chain and moving a little further into the trust spectrum of the technology. And so I think that's also what I find really exciting. Yeah, no, I think that that's true. I think that the, the thing that I've seen even over the last year, which is such a big difference in this space, and just having come from basically the wild, wild west of web one and two, when everybody thought that we could also thumb our nose at government and do lots of different things and tell everybody they didn't understand what we were doing. And taking that learning and really trying to say, actually, we need all the players is such an important mm -hmm. thing here. I'll tell you a funny story. When we when I first met to with uh, MoneyGram, who we also we now have a very deep partnership with, um, the CFO said, have you seen your website? And have you seen the way that you talk about us on your website? And it was very funny because the way that we, we talked about MoneyGram on the website in 2019 when I first met with them was basically that they were this antiquated animal that we were going to disrupt and remove. When in fact, really what MoneyGram and JP Morgan and all of the players that are on the edge and actually have the on and off ramps are exactly the things that crypto and blockchain need and that all chains need. So it was a really eye-opening experience for me when I went back mm -hmm. and looked at our website and said, we always have to think about what we want 
the future to look like, and this isn't what we want the future to look like. So um, one of the things that I have to ask you, because I, um, I've known about Block Damon for a really long time, but how did you come up with the name? Um, you know, I, I mean, it was very basic. I mean, I, I, um, I started Block Damon, um, you know, talking to friends and, 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 you know, collaborators early. Uh, I made a list, like I wanted to build a Heroku for blockchain, really kind of sort of something that felt like picks and shovels is probably good. I kind of saw the token craze and was like, oh, that's probably not going to stick around. And so, um, so I started fairly strategically with the positioning of the company and like selecting an, a vertical I felt um, my skill set is most suitable and for, which I wanted to be long term, uh, not as exposed to crypto volatility, maybe as I, I am now I am though. Uh, and, uh, and so I, uh, uh, I also wanted um, um, to pay homage to some of the things in crypto I care about. And one of the books, for example, that influenced um, Vitalik is a book called Damon. And uh, Damon um, was a book I read. And um, in computer science, a Damon is, a, is an operating system that runs silently in the background. And that's exactly what I wanted Block Demon to be. And so mm -hmm. just really sort of not be visible in the craziness of crypto, but being at the back of it, making it functional. And so Damon was really the word I was excited about. I had a bunch of others. It could have gone a, long, a lot of different ways, but I liked the... Um, uh, I liked uh, Damon and then Block Damon, um, you know, was available and seemed like a good, good idea. And so um, it uh, in the beginning, it's funnily enough, sometimes it still comes up with uh, some of our larger partners who look at it as demon and are like, oh, are you like, why is it a demon? I'm like, it's not a demon, it's a demon. It's actually, but obviously we like the naughtiness of it a little bit and thus our <laughs> logo with the horns and stuff. Exactly. Um, I was going to say yeah. you lean into the naughtiness a little bit, but you, yeah. Yeah. It's a um, and that's the fun part too. You know, we do want to be disruptors. I mean, for sure, but um, we need to do it um, at an interesting scale. But yeah, so the name is actually really important to us. And, and so Damon is still uh, the operating principle of the company, which is we want to be more silent, more in the background. And I think the way I think of the business often is, um, you know, we're probably maybe the largest company in crypto that is uh, the least known, you know, like kind of so like when we're actually, uh, it's interesting to me how much we do and, and a lot of people don't know. And that's actually kind of good, you know, like we don't necessarily want people to know. And, uh, and so um, we've been sort of opposite of the hype cycle. Right. And well, so that was also it's a choice that that's actually it's so funny because when I hired uh, the my the CMO uh, that we brought on to um, SDF when I started after not six months or so after I started my vision for Stellar and and certainly the way that we should approach things was much more like, you know, Intel is that process that Intel makes those chips that process inside the computer People don't really know what the chip does most of the time and like what Intel is, but they see a little logo on top of a computer. It says Intel inside or AMD or whatever. And they think, oh, I could. Yeah. OK, I've heard of that before. That's the vision that I had for Stellar is it should be the thing that's like working for you that you trust, even if you don't know exactly what happens on the network. So I kind of love you guys seem to have like the same sort of vision for that. Yeah, totally. And that's why we always got along with Stellar. I mean, Stellar was really our first contract, I think, at scale. You know, we've worked with Stella um, for a long time. And and uh, and I think we share that affinity. Um, and, and and both, like, I think the care and naughtiness of crypto that is needed, you know, and so I always um, really, really like that. But yeah, for us, that's been um, uh, true. And, and uh, I, you know, the name comes up sometimes, you know, in times like this, when suddenly everything that's blockchain, like people are like, <laughs> drop the block, just be daemon. Um, you know, it's just like you, we go through different phases and uh, it gets more complex around products, you know, when it's mm -hmm. like, OK, how do you call these things and stuff? But, um, you know, we have now smart advisors also helping us figure that <laughs> stuff out. But yeah, it, it worked well for us. Yeah, that's great. So it's, you clearly have a lot of confidence um, from for blockchain and crypto's ability to influence from the global economy perspective. And so the question that I have is like, how do we get from that Pirates Bay to that Spotify? Like, how do we move blockchain? Um, and, and maybe it shouldn't even be blockchain. Maybe it's just the applications that run on top of it uh, to that next level. 
yeah, I think one is for us, uh, we want to do our part by, uh, so, you know, the last five years, I believe Block Demon was the largest importer of compute to crypto, right? And so we run 150,000 nodes. Um, uh, you know, we, we run a lot of infrastructure for a lot of folks. And uh, our goal was to make that easy, right? And so to bring compute to crypto that powers and enables these networks at large scale. And, uh, and we do that by selling nodes and access to these networks. And, you know, we use the latest cloud tools and the best technology and also bare metal to kind of make that possible for institutions. So, and I think now we've achieved that, you know, there's a lot of infrastructure available. There's a lot of, um, <clears throat> a lot more awareness on how to do that. And now we want to push people up the stack, which is ultimately uh, our goal is, is and it's an ambitious one, but we, we want to really commoditize that whole layer. You know, we don't think <clears throat> anyone should work on software on how to run a node or how to connect to a protocol. They can just use our software, do it and be done with it, you know. And uh, and I think people should, instead of investing in like, let's hire 50 engineers and try to be our own part in a decentralized network, um, uh, rather be part of an open source software community um, like ours over time where um, you can participate in writing code that allows people to run their own nodes and institutions to do so. Now, institutions have a different need. They need SLAs and other bits and pieces, and that's where the business angle is for us. Um, but uh, so over time for us, we want to move away from the infrastructure part that's cloud and rare compute to uh, ultimately the APIs that allow you to earn rewards um, to on and off ramp assets, um, to package assets and custodial mm -hmm. brackets of MPC wallet. and uh, and to also uh, ensure uh, ensure these gateways and cross chain um, uh, settlement. And so, what that means, we're, we wouldn't ever settle anything, but that we want to run um, sequencers and 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 transmitters and relayers across these networks for institutions to ensure that the end user has the best user experience without these institutions having to engage with any of those crazy L twos, for example. And so, um, and so that's kind of what we do, you know, and so we have three distinct products. One is Access, which is, you know, the one where we're partners with Stella uh, right. on, for example, which is our full node and API business. And Stella is uh, one of the protocols we support in both, um, you know, on the API side, as well as on on node side. You know, Stella was for a long time uh, our, our entry card into selling any node because Stella nodes are actually not easy to run. No offense. Um, <laughs> and, and so... Uh, very often people reached out and asked for help, you know, like Bitcoin is a little easier, you know, it's just like, oh, it's fairly easy to run a Bitcoin node, but with Stella, hey guys, indexing a Stella node is like, what well, is very, very hard. And so um, we've developed an expertise in that area and that was good for us because not a lot of people could do it, you know, and so um, we, we run, I think, a decent amount of Stella infrastructure and we're fairly capable in doing so. And so, um, and that's how we... Uh, think of it um, as, as on the access side, we then added Stella to our universal API product, which is a product we want exchanges and custodians to use ultimately to schedule transactions um, and uh, for their wallets, for example. Um, and then, um, and so that's one product line. And uh, the second one is staking. Um, that's the one that people often associate with us, even though funnily enough, we started with Bitcoin, Ethereum and Stella uh, mm -hmm. as full node, right? Like, so we come, uh, we were really the first nodes as a service provider. Um, and then, um, yeah, and staking, uh, we've done um, as an extension of that. You know, staking node is also a node. It's just that some of the mechanisms are a little different and you earn rewards, which was important to us because we quickly realized that um, just charging dollars per month for a node is not a way to run a sustainable business over time. And, uh, and so staking was a breath of fresh air because it exposed you to volume related revenue, which is a lot more exciting. Um, and one of the reasons why we got an insane valuation and, and, and had like sort of flow of volume and income that was um, in association with that. Um, I'd say on those two product lines, I'd say in the institutional market, we probably have between 50 to 70% market share. Um, uh, our customers and investors, you know, range like, I mean, you know, you can look on the, I mean, uh, you know, with some of them, we don't want to be too public, but like, I'd say yeah. that, uh, you know, like most likely it's a large crypto company. If you're a large crypto company, you're a customer of ours. Let's put it that way. Like there's not a lot of companies that don't work with us across either one of those two product lines. Um, 
and we've managed <clears throat> to be fairly ubiquitous there. Um, uh, it's uh, either we're your primary provider or your secondary provider, uh, but in one shape, form or another, you're using the blood daemon platform um, to power your infrastructure. And, and, and we're very proud of that. Like that was actually not yeah. an easy journey to get to that. Um, but, you know, we have customers, some of them are public, the JP Morgans, the Goldman Sachs, the Citibanks, uh, Bank of New York, um, uh, are public and, and then others aren't, but like the, the, the overall, I think we, we have a really unique customer base around those services. Um, and a lot of that is fairly modi because it's actually not easy to do, you know, like kind of running like a stellar note is not easy for an institution to come in and hey, we're going to just do this ourselves. Like, mm, you got to hire some guys, spend a lot of time trial and erroring this. And, uh, and the same is true for, yeah, feel free run 50,000 Ethereum validators and hope you get it right. You know, like that's not easy yeah. to do. And so it's it is good, the thing, uh, it is the, the move from the web two world. We figured this out with a lot of different things that made sense for individual companies not to do themselves and to rely on experts to help them to do it. And I think, and, and maybe this is a sort of the, the notion is that the institutional adoption of blockchain technology as just another rail is exactly mm -hmm. what you're trying, like you actually have the ability to even to, to promote that institutional adoption in a much more efficient manner. Because again, like most of these companies don't do, they don't have their own, uh, their own services where they actually host their own servers and they're, they rely on AWS or they rely on other companies or Google Cloud to help them. So it's a really interesting and very simple play to be able to explain, this is what you do in Web2 all the time. Yeah, no, I agree. And so we're excited about that. The third pillar of our business is our MPC uh, WAS wallet uh, as a service business for institutions. What's unique there is we believe in self custody, you know, where um, uh, over time we want you to have custody of your nodes, you know, and so we can run that infrastructure for you, but we'd rather give you the software to do it yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. We also can give you the software to manage your tokens safely and 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 make sure we don't have access to it either. And so um, our MPC wallet stack is integrated into the other two product lines on the API side. And so um, the goal here, going back to the question you asked, um, how do we become part of the spotification of this is to give institutions a full stack. You just made up a word, spotification. I like that. You just made that up. Thank you. I'll <laughs> take it. Yeah, I'll, I'll trademark it. Um, <laughs> is um, to um, to then give institutions, you know, these bare things like where it's like you can put tokens in this wallet, you can uh, uh, replicate this wallet for your users ten million times and put it on a phone, and it's connected to APIs that allow users to move assets in and out very easily to earn rewards very easily, to garner reports very easily, and no one can ever touch these assets but you. And so uh, we don't want them to worry about those basics. You know, they can build mm -hmm. the application on top of that and uh, figure that out. And, and so that's sort of been always our evil master plan that we sort of laid out in like, let's say 21, when we raised all this money is to kind of offer an integrated stack like that. And, um, that's still our strategy. You know, we've, I think, delivered against that strategy um, to the most part. Um, I think what, um, you know, we couldn't have predicted, frankly, is uh, from 21, um, the sort of fairly steep decline uh, in 2022, um, uh, really on, on what all went wrong in crypto land, you know, and then if you compound that with macroeconomic influences and stuff, the market definitely has cooled off and that's just a reality. Um, and so, for us, that hasn't changed much, you know, like mm -hmm. it's, it's yeah. still have the same customer base, the company is still sort of, you know, we're still growing through this. But obviously, um, we think a lot about how to, um, um, you know, ensure that not just us, but also our partners in crypto have longevity, you mm -hmm. know, for the next five years and, 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 and hope that we can bring tangible solutions to the market that will increase volume um, of assets uh, flowing through crypto enabled networks. And so that's really sort of our part um, that we play in the ecosystem, we think, or we want to play. Now, a lot of people want to play that game. And I so um, at least like, um, I think we we have, uh, you know, a tangible business around it. Um, but but that's how we want to answer that challenge, you know, as, as fast to give institutions the tools to do this a lot easier and safer while figuring out, 
you know, what's the licensing model? What's the uh, legal, if whatever, is it a security? Is it not a security? However, you, you can focus on all those questions and don't need to have a, a you know, a hundred people engineering team to run your infrastructure and your APIs and your different custodial integrations and so forth. Well, I think that the, the, what happened over the last, in 2022 and um, to some extent in the beginning of 2023 actually has us closer to the spotification um, of crypto, yeah. because I feel like that needed to happen. There was just so much for uh, even coming into the space and trying to be the one who is not getting caught up in the FOMO and not getting caught up in the glitz and glamour of things and really trying to be focused on like what it is that we need to do. I think that that's where a lot of companies are now. And I think that needed to ha we needed to get through sort of that bubble, our own bubble to be able to get there. Um, so with yeah. respect to our work with you, I mean, obviously we've been a strong partner for a really long time. We're um, so proud and that that trust mechanism is crucial. Uh, from a business standpoint. And we're really excited about the launch of, um, of Sorbonne and our work that we're doing, particularly with the RPC infrastructure with you guys. We haven't been shy. Um, in fact, we've actually acknowledged very publicly that we're really late to smart contracts. Um, if you talk to Jed, and I know that you know Jed, if you talk to Jed in the old days, mm -hmm. he would say we never needed it, a smart contract. And um, I think we were probably right then, but right now it makes the most sense for us to be able to bring this to the market because to be able to bring developers and let them have greenfield space is really important. So we also think that this late mover advantage gives us this opportunity to build smart contracts really differently, uh, especially with like this mature infrastructure providers like you. So how do you see the opportunity for stellar based businesses to work with Block Daemon to unlock the, the, the really the potential and, and really the future of Sorabon when it launches? Yeah, I think, listen, I think it's it's exactly uh, where the industry is at currently, right? Like, so we need to be able to build applications. Um, uh, and that's the moment, right? And so for these applications to run, uh, you need uh, uh, infrastructure. And so there's two components to infrastructure, right? So there's the hardware part, like there's the, you got to run servers, you need to rely on those servers, you need to connect to these servers, um, and you need to make sure that um, um, there's a degree of trustlessness in that architecture. And um, and that's where we help, you know? And then you have uh, Sabon and, and the actual protocol that then allows, uh, you know, that runs on that complex architecture um, of infrastructure. And, uh, and, you know, I think what's so powerful about Stella, similarly to us, is a little bit like we've all been around, you know, there's a track record there, there's um, uh, resourcing there, there's an experience there. And so um, you want to make sure that you can trust the bare bones of what the software is and what the infrastructure is, you know. And so I feel like as a developer, you want to make sure you don't have to worry about the protocol layer and the infrastructure mm -hmm. layer because, you know, like you want to focus on the application layer. And so um, finding the right um, blockchain to build on is very difficult. Um, and like with any company, uh, you want to make sure if you put your software career on the line, you want to know it's a, a, it's a protocol that has a serious backing. Uh, where people make smart decisions um, that have a track record of building great software. So one of the things I always find challenging when new protocols launch, for example, mm -hmm. they get very hyped up and, 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 and then a year later, you don't hear anything from them anymore. And that's normally what happens, you know? And so it's not easy to do what Stella did, um, which is to sort of be a constant gateway and, 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 and a constant presence in that market, right? And so there's a reliability here that is really, really important, I think. And um, obviously, Stella also, similar to us, has worked with institutions. And so I think if you're a developer building applications, um, if, if that's your stack, people will not uh, discount you for it, you know, because um, when you want to build applications and ultimately um, uh, get traction with these applications, you need to partner with people who need to distribute your applications or, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, allow you to uh, uh, give them their service, give, give, give their services to you so you can make them more accessible via an application you build. And so how the stack looks matters. And so um, you want to make sure that you can reference uh, a software stack uh, that uh, gets green waved, you know, where it's not like, oh, wait, you're building on this super speculative, crazy software um, that, uh, you know, is uh, super hyped and we don't know if it's around in a year. We're not interested in your application, right. you know, and so I think it's, it's really important to um, 
bring that trust, like trust that, right? And so, um, and to your point, you said something so beautiful, which is um, it's, um, it, this business doesn't work without trust. And uh, if you want to build applications and you want them to reach a lot of people, you need to work with third parties to get distribution. These third parties are not going to give you distribution if you can't convince them that your applications are stable and uh, functioning and don't uh, jeopardize the experience of the that the customer has with the distributor. And so um, there aren't a lot of holistic stacks available for developers yep. that you can actually build on and um, specifically for institutions. So I think this is a very powerful combination and, and a very exciting development in the market. And obviously Jed and, and you know, team, like, I mean, you know, he's a smart guy. I mean, he knows a lot about software. And so, you know, he's, uh, uh, he's, he's uh, a little bit like us and uh, block team. And uh, sometimes, you know, it's one of those people that is probably good for him, not as known as he should be. That's um, right. And so I think he likes it yeah. that way. Just, yeah, I think we yeah. all kind of like it that way. One of the things yeah. that I think is so interesting is I think people get caught up in this notion of trustless, the, 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 the networking, the, the way that the software works, the way that the consensus mechanism works, it has to work in a trustless environment. But those of us mm -hmm. that have been around for a while understand that business, we need to actually really understand who we're working with and what that looks like. So, so grateful that you guys have spent so much time and energy on Stellar and, uh, and I hope that everybody reaps the benefits of it um, even more so than they already have, because I think we have a big future ahead of us. Um, I'm so glad we were able to sit down and have this conversation. It was really nice. Uh, and I'm grateful that you were able to share so much about not just your journey, but just so much wisdom about how we can approach the next phase. So but one last question, uh, where can people keep up with you and keep up with your work? Well, listen, if you find out, you tell me and then I can cut it off. No, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I mean, I'm on Twitter, um, uh, not that I do a lot there. Uh, I really like to uh, block demon to speak for me. And so blockdemon.com, you can find out a lot more about us where block demon itself has a Twitter presence. Um, and uh, and that's it. You know, that's the easiest way to learn about us and, and stay in touch. Otherwise, reach out to me directly. Uh, Constantine, no E at the end at blockdemon.com. Always like getting random emails. Um, with interesting bits of information. And so, um, and that's that. Thank you so much. So grateful for your time. Thank you.